Well, thank you so much to Anne and her team for organizing the meeting and inviting me to speak. I am a physician, but uh, I spend actually the majority of my time running uh, my laboratory, and um, we are very uh, focused on trying to understand the basic uh, underlying biology of why myeloproliferative neoplasms occur and to use that information to develop better treatments. And I've worked in this field now for about 11 years, and in that time, I've seen tremendous advances. I've seen the FDA approval of two JAK2 inhibitors, rexolitinib, in 2011, and then uh, about a month ago, fedratinib, after a very long uh, road, but thankfully uh, got approval. I've also seen the discovery of calverticulin mutations, and I'm very optimistic that um, this discovery will uh, help us to better de develop ultimately curative therapies uh, for calverticulin and, and other forms of MPN. Um, so there's been tremendous progress, but there are substantial deficiencies, I think, in the current treatments that we have, and we really don't have um, ways to cure these diseases aside from allogeneic stem cell transplantation. And so therefore, I strongly endorse everything that's gone before in terms of uh, adapting strategies that allow you to live with these diseases in the long term. Because as, as, we, as we are right now, these are the chronic MPNs. These are diseases that we manage and that uh, we can't definitively um, eradicate. Um, so I don't have very many slides. I'm the only thing that stands between you and the morning break. So uh, uh, that's good that I don't have many slides. But what I, what I wanted to try to do was try to get across, uh, you know, some fundamental principles um, to try to sort of help you understand why, the, why you have this disease and sort of ideas that we're working on to try to um, ultimately develop, as I said, curative therapies for these diseases. So, um, probably the most, co I have a clinic, uh, you know, uh, once a week, and probably the most common reason, or the most com one of the most common questions I get is, you know, why did I get this disease? And um, I think actually we have, a, we, have a, we have a good understanding of the genes that cause this disease. And that's actually really fundamentally important, obviously, because if we're to develop treatments to cure this disease, we, we need like the basic, sort of map of, of how it happens and why it happens. And so we have a very good understanding of the, the basic three major genes that are really the causative mutations or genes that um, drive the development of this disease. And these are not um, mutations that you are born with. We, we think there are probably and almost certainly some types of genetic dis predisposition you know, that causes you to acquire these mutations, but these mutations um, are not in all the cells of your body, they're just in your bone marrow and in your blood. And so, you know, your bone marrow is basically the factory that makes blood, and uh, the reason you can make blood your whole life is you have what are called these stem cells, uh, which I've just sort of uh, shown here. And these are very rare cells in the bone marrow, they're, they're very dormant or quiescent, they really don't do very much, um, but, um, you know, they make a copy or replicate themselves, um, you know, uh, once or twice per year. And in doing so, they have to, you know, they have to replicate the entire DNA genetic code. And as I think Dr. Sherber already alluded to, we know that uh, it's normal, in everybody mistakes are made during that process. And we know that as you get older, more mistakes are made. So with every decade of life, you're making more mistakes as you're making a copy of that stem cell. And those mistakes are called mutations. We have repair mechanisms that are, are built in within our body to try to repair those mutations, but, the, but mutations slip through. And most of the time, the mutation has, has no consequence to the cell, and it just marks the fact that that cell has made a copy of itself. And it, you know, it's almost, it's like just evidence that the cell has made a copy of itself. But sometimes uh, the mutation does have a consequence for the cell. And that is, that is what happens with MPN. We have these so-called MPN initiating mutations or MPN causative mutations. And these are the JAK2 mutation being the most common one, the second one being calverticulin, and the third one being the MPL mutation. And, and what that mutation does is it, it makes that cell that has it have a growth advantage over the cell that doesn't. And it does that by making the cell more sensitive and more responsive 
to its signals, microenvironmental signals, that tell it to grow or, or, or uh, replicate. And that's basically the fundamental basis of this, of this disease. It's an acquired mutation within the bone marrow, within these blood stem cells, uh, when they make a copy of themselves. And as a result of that, the cell is more active, it outgrows the normal cell, and over time, that results in um, the development of more cells than you need. And that's fundamentally the problem in MPN. It's a myeloproliferative disease. You're proliferating, making more cells than you need, of the myeloid lineage, which is right, white cells, red cells, and platelets. And so um, that is really uh, the basis of the disease, and that's why p patients typically de develop high high blood counts. And when we look in their bone marrow, they have increased numbers of these, these cells. And again, I think as Dr. Sh uh, Sh Sherber alluded to and gave you a very nice analogy of the repetitive cut on your skin and the formation of scar, um, what can happen over long periods of time is if you have these sort of excess production of cells in inducing this you know, inflammation, that that actually can damage then the microenvironment in the bone marrow in which the cells live, revol resulting in the development of, of myelofibrosis and scarring within the bone marrow. And as, as that happens, you know, stem cells that should normally just be in the bone marrow start moving out to find other places to live, and they form, uh, they go to the spleen and actually try to make blood in the spleen. So for any patients who have you know, myelofibrosis in a big spleen, you're, you, the reason it's big is because it's, it's, it's full of blood production, which shouldn't be happening there and should be only happening in the bone marrow. But because of this scarring, um, the spleen starts making, making blood. So, um, so as I said, these are the causative of mutations. And, and just, I also want to highlight that you know, we've made tremendous progress. The JAK2 mutation was discovered in 2005. Um, if you have polycythemia vera, you have a JAK2 mutation. Uh, and then if you have ET or MF, about 50% of people have a JAK2 mutation. Um, the MPL mutation, which is quite rare, you know, uh, is seen in ET and MF, somewhere between 1% and 10% of patients, discovered in 2006. And then in 2013, we had the Calvertico mutation discovered in the majority of people who don't have a JAK2 or MPL mutation, you can see here. There's a small number of patients what are called these so-called triple negative um, mutations, uh, triple negative, that is you don't have JAK2, MPL, or CALOR, um, and that's a, you know, less than 10% of patients with ET and MF. Um, so, uh, so, as I said, we really do understand, you know, the genes that cause these disease, diseases, and uh, I think that's very, very important as we think about therapeutics and ways to target them. Um, so, specifically, the calor mutation, and um, this is a really intriguing story and really, um, I think, speaks to the power of, like, science and research and how important it is to understand these diseases. So. For a very long time, and when I was in the clinic, when I was a fellow, we used to see patients, a uh, hemonc fellow at Dana-Farber, uh, before discovery of cow reticulum, we, we would often see patients who had very high platelet counts, didn't have a JAK2 mutation, didn't have an MPL mutation, and we were always in this conundrum, you know, do you have an MPN, or do you just have a high platelet in reaction to something? And we never really had a definitive way to answer that. And then in 2013, two groups, one in England and one in um, Austria, um, basically said, okay, there must be something there in, the, in these patients who don't have a JAK2 or MPL mutation, and we're going to try to work it out. And what they did was what is called whole exome sequencing. So they sequenced all of the coding genes um, in those patients, in the blood of those patients um, who did, looked like they had ET or MF, but didn't have a JAK2 or MPL mutation. And that was how they discovered calreticulin mutations. And this was an extremely unexpected finding because calreticulin is like, it's basically this housekeeping gene in, in the body. It's important for kind of making sure the proteins in your body are folded normally. And so nobody would have hypothesized that this gene would cause a myeloproliferative disease. It was extremely unexpected. And I said, it, as I said, it speaks to the power of, you know, um, novel approaches and unbiased, you know, uh, genomic approaches to really pull out these genes. And once that's discovered, now we can really focus on uh, understanding how this gene causes the disease and how we're going to target it um, uh, to eradicate the disease. So this mutation, calreticulin, it occurs in the stem cell as well. And what it does is it, it, it particularly affects platelet production 
And it, it skews your bone marrow to kind of start moving towards making more of these myeloid cells, and in particular, megakaryocytes, which are the cells that are the precursor cells to platelets. So platelets are that part of your body, platelets circulate in your blood. These are the part of the blood that are important for you know, stopping you from bleeding, and they're made by these megakaryocytes, which are these very big cells that live in the bone marrow. And what the calreticulin mutation does is, is it specifically activates the receptor that is on uh, megakaryocytes, and it causes overproduction of megakaryocytes, and as a result, overproduction of platelets. So ca patients who have calreticular mutations often have very high platelet counts, but normal white cell and red cell counts, as opposed to JAK2 mutated uh, patients, or patients of a JAK2 mutation where you can have all the cells be affected. So the calreticular mutation is very specific to these me megakaryocytes and platelets, but it's arising in this stem cell compartment. So ultimately, to cure the disease, we, we Need to, we need to eradicate these cells that have the mutation in the stem cell, and right now we don't have a way to do that, as I said, other than through an allogeneic stem, uh, stem cell transplant. Um, so that's just to show you how that happens. So there are some differences between, we've learned a lot, even though calreticulin is only discovered in 2013, there are uh, differences between calreticulin and patients, patients with calreticulin mutation versus a JAK2 mutation. If you have ET, patients with calreticulin mutations often tend to be younger. As I said already, they tend to have a, a, a isolated high platelet count with the red cells and uh, white cells often being normal. And then they seem to have a lower risk of thrombosis than as compared to a JAK2 a patient with a JAK2 mutation. And in ET, this seems to be at least twofold lower um, uh, than in uh, JAK2. So I think this, again, understanding these genes, understanding the mutations, and correlating that with kind of the important clinical thing, uh, outcomes like thrombosis and um, uh, other outcomes, I think it's very important because it allows us, it helps us in deciding, you know, what your risk of having some of these complications is and then how we should intervene to reduce that risk. Um, the other, this point I just really want to get back to again, so in general, mo a lot of what we do in MPN is we, try, we manage the disease, right, and we try to reduce the risk of um, complications, in particular thrombosis, and we use things like aspirin, antiplatelet agent to, to do that. And then we sometimes bring down the platelet count, particularly if you're older or you have had a prior thrombosis or if you have a very high platelet count, and these are some of the things that we can use, hydroxyurea, interferon, or anagrolide. Some of you may be on these drugs. But fundamentally, you know, we're just controlling the blood counts, right? We're not fixing the underlying problem, which is that you're making too much blood cells because you have this mutation in your stem cells. And so, ultimately, what we really want to do is try to develop ways that we can specifically um, eradicate those um, cells that have the mutation, that we can develop better ways to do that. So, these are very important treatments. They definitely um, are reduce the risk of, of, of complications, and they're, they're the backbone of what we do, and they're very, very important. But I think um, we have deficiencies, as I said, in that they can't eliminate the cells that have the mutation. And then, of course, we have um, the JAK2 inhibitors, ruxolitinib, and more recently, fedratinib now was approved in, in, um, in, uh, for the treatment of myelofibrosis. And what's very interesting is that originally, when the ruxolitinib studies were done, um, actually, the caroticular mutation ha wasn't discovered, and then this group in Italy went back and actually worked out who in the study had a caroticular mutation. That's shown in brown, so you can see they're much less common than the JAK2 mutations, which are in yellow. And this is just looking at the reduction in the spleen size. So if you go into the negative here, you had your spleen go down. So the majority of, of patients with myelofibrosis who are treated with ruxolitinib do have reduction in the size of their spleen, as shown here. And this occurs regardless of whether you have a JAK2 mutation or a calreticulin mutation. So patients with calreticulin mutations who have myelofibrosis do benefit from JAK2 inhibitors in terms of clinical uh, responses and reducing their spleen size. And then I will, I will just end by this, this point. So this is an area that my lab and many other labs are interested in, is this idea of the uh, use of immunotherapy to target calreticulin mutation. And probably if you read any newspapers or if you just 
exist in the world. You, you know that immunotherapy right now uh, in, in, for the treatment of cancer has really been just this phenomenal uh, explosion in terms of, of drugs and effic efficacy uh, in, in, in lots of different cancers. And we're particularly interested in uh, the application of immunotherapy to caroticulin mutations uh, for the reason that the mutations actually change the sequence of the proteins. So this is just, as I said, caroticulin is this gene that uh, is important for a protein that regulates normal folding of proteins in your body. So it kind of has this housekeeping regulatory role. And this is just the normal protein up here. The mutations are all at the end of the protein. And they change the sequence of the protein at the end. So the red is here where you have the mutated protein. And then this is the normal unmutated protein. And uh, actually, this has already been used. Uh, pathologists who, who make the diagnosis of MPN have been able to develop antibodies against this part of the protein. Because as you can see, this is very specific to the mutated protein, right? It's not in the normal protein. So if you have this, that means it's an MPN cell, right? Because it's carrying this mutation. And so uh, pathologists develop antibodies to be able to show, okay, here's, here's the cells, right, within the bone marrow that have, have this mu mutated form of the protein at the end. And you can see lots of, so the brown are the positive cells. So on the top you have someone who has a JAK2 mutation, there's no brown cells. Here's an MPL, there's no brown cells. Here's a triple negative, there's no brown cells. But if you look at different types of calverticular mutations, this antibody is picking up this mutated form of the protein, and you can see there's lots of brown. And there's brown particularly in these, what are called megakaryocytes. So these big cells here are megakaryocytes. And so, so this can be used for diagnosis already, right? We have antibodies that can detect this mutated form of the protein and say, okay, these cells are being expressed in the, in the bone marrow. But what the hope would be, would be that through the development of immunotherapy, you might be able to develop an antibody that's not just a diagnostic antibody, but a, a therapeutic antibody that could bind to those cells and result in the killing of those, of those cells. And so there's a lot of work by uh, several pharmaceutical companies actually, and by our lab and many other people um, around this work. I don't think it's anywhere close to being in the clinic, but I think um, I'm optimistic that, um, you know, as I said, we will develop ways to try to target this mutated calverticulin using immunotherapy or other approaches in the, in the future. So um, I'll end there. Yeah, I just really want to say that um, I think we've made tremendous progress. There's a lot of work still to be done, but I do think uh, this is a phenomenal moment in, in science in general and particularly in cancer biology where we're making extraordinary progress um, at very fast pace. So there's lots of reasons to be optimistic for the future and for better treatments as we go forward. And so I'll just end there. These are the folks in my lab. Um, uh, I also want to highlight what has already been said, that uh, research, I firmly and strongly believe that research is, is so important to understanding these diseases and developing better therapies. And of course, research costs a lot of money. And I've been very fortunate to be funded by all of these organizations, including the NIH, uh, the MPN uh, Research Foundation, specifically focused on the Interferon Project, and then the um, LLS Society, the Chang Zuckerberg Initiative, and Gabriel the Angels Foundation. Um, so thank you so much, and I am happy to take any questions. <laughs>